So today we're going to be ranking all the handheld consoles from the absolute worst to the very best. Now this ranking is pretty self-explanatory. F means that it's just a total abomination. D means that it's, you know, not good, but not totally bad. Like it's barely passable. C means it's average. It's not, it's okay. It's not great, but it's not bad either. B means it's pretty good, it's pretty solid, and it only has like a few minor issues, but overall it has a good library, it has good games, and the controls feel okay, and just overall it's it's a good experience. A ranking means it's excellent, it's it's an amazing handheld, and it's it's just amazing. <laughs> and then S means it's it's just the very best of the of the handheld. It's nothing can compare to it. And of course we're gonna be of course, this list is going to be time relative, so obviously if we're like comparing the, the Game Boy to the Game Boy Advance, we're not going to rank the Game Boy Advance higher because the graphics are better or something like that. You know what I'm saying? So this whole list is going to be time relative. It's going to be for its time, was it good, and was it a good experience even back then? We're not going to really talk about whether or not it aged well because that seems irrelevant to me. Anyway, let's get on with this list. We're going to start off with the very worst because that's always the most fun. So let's start off with these four abominations. So the Nokia N-Gage. Can, can you imagine playing games on this? Better yet, can you even imagine using this as a phone? Honestly, this taco shell piece of shit. Can you imagine holding that on your ear? You'd look like a complete jackass. So you wouldn't want to do that. But it was essentially a multimedia device that... It was a phone because you could see all the all the number buttons over here. This deep head is just awful. And the, the overall layout of buttons is not good for a cell phone. And certainly not good to play games. There's no noteworthy games to think of on the N-Gage. It was pretty much of the same quality as those flip phone games that you had back in the day in the mid 2000s it was pretty much a glorified version of that the end gauge was nothing special and it was a total abomination i thought i thought the end gauge was bad now we have the r zone oh lord the r zone oh my god this thing is terrible so the cartridge goes here instead of going in the back it goes here and the screen is like a pop-up screen like a clamshell kind of thing going on and not only it like, like that that alone isn't terrible but it's a virtual boy knockoff J just just set that set that in it is a knockoff of the virtual boy you know one of the biggest commercial failures in gaming history total embarrassment for nintendo and nintendo usually comes out with pretty solid products but the virtual boy was just a, a total abomination. And the, and the Virtual Boy is not going to be on this, on this list because I don't consider it to be a, quite a handheld because it was more of like a virtual reality thing and you really couldn't hold it in your hands. You can hold the controller in your hands, but then in that case, then every console is a handheld. You know what I'm saying? Because you had to have the virtual headset. You'd have to like have it placed down on the ground with, with a tripod. And then you had to lean into it on the ground or maybe sit on the desk with it or something. It was not handheld. So that's why the Virtual Boy is not on this list because it really isn't a handheld in my opinion. But the R-Zone is. They initially released a virtual reality headset kind of thing going on like the Virtual Boy. But it totally failed so they decided to go with a handheld version. But they still decided to use this terrible red screen which was bad enough in virtual reality. But just the screen itself with no virtual reality is even worse if, if such a thing even exists. The games were not great. The red screen looked like crap. And like I said, it, it didn't even have any, any games to, to really that were really noteworthy. So the Yarzone was just a total piece of shit. The Gizmondo was also a total piece of shit. It was just an awful, awful handheld. So Nintendo had Super Mario Brothers, right? Sega had Sonic. 
Sony had Crash Bandicoot for a time, and that well, Sony had a lot of mascots. They had Crash Bandicoot. It was between Crash and Spyro. Then it was Ratchet and Clank and Sly Cooper and Jack and Daxter, and they didn't really have a mascot. <laughs> the The idea of the video game mascot kind of died along with the the Xbox and the PS2 around that era, maybe around the PS3. But back when mascots were a thing, around 2004, 2005. Gizmondo had a mascot. It had a flagship title that was geared towards kids. Although the title of the game, you know, makes that questionable. The name of their flagship title, their definitive exclusive game on the Gizmondo, the name of the game was Sticky Balls. Sticky, Sticky Balls is the name of the game. And it actually has a song. They actually made a song and a music video for this game and i'm going to play it right now because it's i, I, I you guys have to see this for yourself <laughs> their main title on the Gizmondo. The gameplay was even more cringy than the video itself. Gameplay was not very good. <laughs> it really wasn't. It was uh, just your, it was some kind of platformer puzzle based game. It wasn't a good mesh and, and the game itself was just not good or even if it was like mediocre at best it's still not good enough to, to, to shell out hundreds of dollars for this piece of garbage. And it was more of a multimedia device. You could see it had a play button on it. It had a rewind and fast forward and it had a stop button. And it had like bumper buttons that kind of looked like cameras. D-pad was totally trash though. You could play videos. You could play music. You can do all that stuff on it. Back then, multimedia was like the new thing at that point. So everyone had to have a multimedia device. The N-Gage was one of them. The Gizmondo though was just total trash. I mean, it didn't have any good games and... It wasn't really that impressive in terms of features and everything because at that point the PSP was out around the same time and it just blew this thing out of the water so then you have another device from a uh, Tiger Electronics this was released by Tiger Electronics by the way I, f I think I forgot to mention that the gamecom or the game.com whatever you want to call it this thing tried to be so innovative but uh, I guess it was just so way ahead of its time but being ahead of its time doesn't mean that it deserves a free pass. This this console was a total... This handheld was a total... Just a total piece of dog shit. Like, it was awful. This is probably the worst of the bunch. I mean, maybe the R zone was worse. But you can see this thing had a stylus. It had, like, four buttons, which four buttons for a handheld back then was pretty good. But the D-pad was not great. And even if, like, even if all that was fine... The, the console itself was not good. The handheld, as a handheld, it was okay. It was not too bulky, but it still was not as sleek and slim as the Game Boy because they had to compensate. They had to make it a little bit bigger because of all these features they put in, like the touchscreen, 
and the stylus over here. And it also had a mo like a, a, a slot on the top where you can connect a modem to it and connect to the internet. You know, back in 1997, that would mean... That's where the .com comes from, by the way. The game.com. Although it's supposed to be pronounced the game.com. I don't know. It's just this whole thing is weird. But you're you, you connected your phone line to this thing. And you can only read text. You couldn't, like, watch videos or anything like that. Which, you know, a portable device back in the late 90s. That's to be expected. But what was the point of having this feature? Because it was completely useless. You'd have to connect... This is back at a point where you, you couldn't really, like, be wireless or anything like that. So you'd have to connect it to your modem on the phone line. And, you, and back then, you could only have one device on at a time. So you'd have to disconnect your phone. And you'd also have to disconnect your computer, you know, to, to the internet. What, what would be the point? You could read emails on this thing. Okay. Like, why wouldn't you just use a computer at that point? This this The whole gimmick of this console was a total failure. And the games were not much better. They were inferior ports of the Game Boy. Keep that in mind. This console was released around 1998-1999. I believe it was 1999. And it had worse ports. Inferior ports. Compared to a console that was released 10 years prior. I thought Nintendo was embarrassing with their inferior ports. Oh, the Game.com compared to the Game Boy? <laughs> it steals the cake, man. So these consoles are just awful. And I don't think anyone's going to disagree with me on this part of the list. But as soon as I get to D, oh, I think the dislikes and some of the negative comments are going to start coming in. Let's take a look, shall we? Okay. So we got interesting lineup of handhelds. Uh, I'm sure most of you, uh, the majority of you, recognize this little thing over here. Nintendo Switch. So this is not going to be... Okay, let me make this clear. When I put the Nintendo Switch on this list, remember this list is about handhelds. First and foremost, about the best handhelds. So even if the Switch may be a good system overall, even if the gimmick is not that good, but the games are great, solid games like Zelda, Breath of the Wild, and Mario Odyssey, and so on and so forth, it is not up for debate that the Nintendo Switch as a handheld device in 2017, because that's when it came out in 2017 as a handheld the Switch is a laughing stock 2 hour battery life 2 hour battery life for a 2017 handheld do I even need to do I need do I even need to go further? Might as well. Look how fucking gigantic this thing is. This thing cannot fit in your pocket. Now, maybe I'm old school. I guess bigger it is supposed to be better now. This screen is way too big. You do not need a screen this huge for a handheld. They could have made the screen much smaller than what they did here. Oh my god, I... People say handheld gaming. Nintendo just saved handheld gaming. No, they made it worse. This is not handheld. This thing is... It, this thing is almost more handheld than this. Not quite, but pretty close. You can't fit this thing in your pocket. The battery life is abysmal. So you're gonna have to be carrying like a book bag around you with an AC charger or whatever whatever adapter you you, you have with the Switch. And it's just, I can't imagine anyone thinking that this is a viable handheld. In all practicality, you cannot take the Switch on the go. Because even if, even if you could, you know, even if you, you, you didn't care that it had a two-hour battery life, which is just downright pathetic, you can't fit the damn thing in your pockets. You're going to have to carry around some kind of knapsack or bag or some kind of satchel, something with you to be able to hold the thing because you can't fit in your pocket and you're not going to carry it around with you in your hand all day. So in all practicality, unless you like playing in, just playing in the car, I personally don't because I get car sick every time I do pl try to play a video game in the car. So that ain't it for me. 
it's just not a good handheld. And do you even want to talk about the Joy-Con controls? Because that's another topic. Terrible. Downright terrible. The D-pad on the Switch is awful. The analog sticks just, I mean, the analog sticks are passable for a handheld. They're, they're really small and they're, they're not very responsive, but for a handheld, it's, it's passable. But when you, when you put the Joy-Con into, like, that controller kind of thing, it's not a good controller for, for a home console. It's passable for a handheld, but overall, like, the, just the, the limitations of it doesn't make it a viable handheld at all. So, you know, I know some people might not be happy about this ranking on the D rank, but in all practicality, even if it has good games, it compared to not even modern standards, standards from, like, 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago, this feels like a step back and not a step forward in handheld gaming. So that's why I had no choice but to put the Switch on the D rank. Okay. Sega Nomad. Sega Nomad was... I decided not to give it an F because although it wasn't that amazing, it, it also had... It actually had the same problems as the Switch. It was way too bulky. And it had a mediocre battery life of like about two hours or i think it was actually at this nomad actually had a longer battery life than the switch it had a four hour battery life and it was a portable genesis which at the time it was this thing was released around 1994 the genesis was you know reaching the end of its life cycle but it was still pretty relevant so imagine a portable version of the genesis yeah it was a pretty big deal back then it didn't sell so well and it really wasn't a great handheld imagine having a giant ass genesis cartridge packed on top of this it really wasn't that great of a handheld but it was still a cool novelty so that's why i decided to put it higher on the list and i think it's pretty much on par with the switch in my opinion then you got the Lynx, which you know very innovative it was the first handheld color handheld with color in it but look at how giant this thing is they had to make the thing so huge in order to be able to do that. I will say that the Lynx was an okay system that had a lot of momentum going for it, but unfortunately, it lost that momentum pretty quickly because Atari was focused on, out of all things, the Atari Jaguar. So they, they focused all their efforts on the Jaguar. They barely put any games on the Lynx, similar to the PlayStation Vita, their situation with Sony just abandoning it like not even a year into into its life cycle and that's the same thing that happened with the Lynx and it could have it could have been so much better but Atari completely dropped the ball with it very innovative the controls were pretty solid it, again it was pretty big but they did release a smaller version of it but I still don't think it was that amazing of a of a handheld but it was ranked a little bit higher than an f because at least it did innovate quite a bit and it was it, it had a few decent games on it i mean not a lot and that's why it's really on this list if it had more games it would have easily been the c ranking but it really only had like not not a lot of games maybe like 30 games tops really not a lot so let's move on to the wonder swan which, in case you don't know what the Wonder Swan is, I'm sure most of you don't. It's essentially a... It was the last system made by Yokoi. And if you don't know who Yokoi was, he was uh, the Japanese programmer and he, a designer, video game designer. He made the Virtual Boy, which was not his greatest accomplishment. But he created. he was the inventor of the D-pad. He created the D-pad. Why someone who creates something so amazing would create an abomination like this with the two with the t like? Do you have like two left hands growing out of you? Are you some kind of mutant? Why the hell do you need two D pads? Beyond me. But it didn't have too many great games. Like it, on its own, though, it wasn't a terrible handheld. But what killed it was that it just could not compete with the Game Boy at the time, and that's why the third party support was not that great, and it didn't have a lot of great games. But overall, I, I, I don't feel like it deserves an F because it wasn't just a total abomination like these things over here. So that's why I feel like it's appropriate to rank this a little bit higher on the list. 
All right, so I decided to rank the Sega Game Gear higher than the Switch. I know a lot of people might not like that very much, but the Sega Game Gear was a solid handheld at the time. It required six AA batteries and was a total pain in the ass, but I think the Sega Game Gear was awesome. I think it had a lot of good games. It had more games and better games than the Lynx, in my opinion. Like, all those 8-bit Sonic games were pretty good, and that's why it had so much so so much good uh support for first party and third party because it was essentially a portable master system for all intents and purposes because it had 8-bit the same graphics as the as the master system and the same control layout you know two buttons and a d-pad because that's all you really needed back then but uh it still wasn't that great it was okay i still think it was better than the links because like i said it had a lot more games than it had better games but, again, what kind of limited it, similar to the, the Lynx and the Switch, <laughs> was its lack of portability and the mediocre battery life. Especially since it took six AA batteries. Couldn't even have a decent battery life. Now, that's pretty bad. But, overall, it had good games. Uh, some of my favorite games were the 8-bit Sonic games, like I said. Sonic Triple Trouble, Sonic 1 and 2 ported from the Master System to the Game Gear. I didn't really like Sonic Labyrinth and Sonic Blast, but was there anything else? Uh, I feel like there was another uh, Sonic. What was it? Sonic Chaos or something like that? I forget. Forget what the name of the name of that game was. But that game was all right. And then what else did you have? Oh, there was also the Lion King 8-bit version, which I thought was pretty fun uh, back when the, the movie first came out. And you also had Ren and Stimpy. Uh, you had a really fun Ren and Stimpy game. I remember. That was released on the Game Gear that I had a lot of fun playing. And, of course, Streets of Rage. Streets of Rage was awesome. Uh, and he had you know some pretty solid 8-bit games on, on this on the system. So that's why I got to say, man, like the, the, the Sega Game Gear deserves a C. Because although it wasn't amazing, it was still a solid system. And despite its limitations, it was okay. So here's the, the Turbo Express. Looks very similar to a Game Boy in terms of its button layout and its D-pad and all that stuff. It was essentially a portable Turbo Graphics 16. It, it was 16-bit portable system released around 1990, 1991, I believe. So it was uh, pretty advanced for its time, and the battery life again wasn't that great. But it was essentially a portable Turbo Graphics 16, and the Turbo Graphics 16 is very underrated, and that's why I think that the Turbo Express deserves a C ranking because. The Turbo Graphics itself was good, and a portable version of that is very good. So the Turbo Express deserves the C ranking here. Then you have the Nvidia Shield Portable, as it's now called colloquially. Yeah, I just totally butchered that word, but you know what I'm saying. Previously, or now these days with the with the Nvidia, because now they make consoles now or devices, whatever you want to call them. They stopped, they decided to take away what made the shield unique and just make a, just use that controller that you see that's attached to the screen and just detach it and make the screen and the controller two separate things and make it like a tablet kind of thing, which I think was just awful. You just completely stripped away the uniqueness that the NVIDIA shield platform had because it was a portable device that was actually viable for gaming because it had all the the bells and whistles of a, of a real console controller and it also had more advanced features than even the PlayStation Vita did that was released one year before because the Nvidia Shield I mean it was very pricey I remember it retailed for about $350 and they they brought it down to $300 and it was a, it was a good platform it had a nice you know the touchscreen wasn't was good um like, it, it, it wasn't too much interfere. The controller didn't really cause too much interference from the touchscreen. You, you could... It, it really was a good layout. It looks pretty clunky, but it was actually pretty good. And overall, I think that it was a solid handheld. Uh, it was the first handheld, and I think the only handheld, that allows you to stream PC games on the go. So, that's cool. And overall, and, and also... Any, all the, any of those mobile FPS games that are just awful with touchscreen or any game that's awful with touchscreen, 
you have a controller right there in front of you and playing mobile games is a lot more uh as a much better experience than than just playing with your with your cell phone definitely and the controller is attached to it so you don't have to buy a separate controller and you could use it on the go seamlessly so that's why i decided to rank the nvidia shield portable with a c ranking again it doesn't deserve anything higher than that because it really wasn't like anything too mind-blowing but it was pretty good for what it was neo geo pocket color now they there was an original neo geo pocket but it lasted a good six months so i'm not going to count it here the neo geo pocket color tried to compete with the game boy color and unfortunately it didn't succeed very well but it did have some solid games it had metal slug as one game i can think of from the top of my head you also had that portable Sonic game, which was very rare at that time because Sega didn't really put their games on other platforms. But I think at that point they abandoned, they completely abandoned their their handheld aspirations because the the Nomad and the Genesis were Nomad and Genesis. The Nomad and the Game Gear were commercial failures, so they decided to focus on the Dreamcast. Uh, and unfortunately, that didn't work out for them, but. The Neo Geo Color actually like allowed you to connect it to the Dreamcast, and it would kind of act like as a kind of like a VMU. If you remember the VMU on the on the Dreamcast controller, where it's like that little little virtual chip that had like you know some things going on, on the screen, and you could take it with you on the go. If you attached it to a Dreamcast, it could have similar functionalities to the VMU, although it wasn't quite like a VMU, but very similar to one. And overall, it had some pretty decent games. I forget the name of that other game that was also really good. Dark, Dark something. It was a Dark Fantasy, something like that. Anyone in the comments who even knows what I'm talking about can uh, can remind me of that. But that was another good game on the, the Neo Geo Pocket Color. Bit of a mouthful, but it was overall a solid handheld. Unfortunately, wasn't didn't live up to its full potential because although it was a solid handheld, the graphics were good, The that, that joystick... Oh man, that D-pad slash joystick thing, it made fighting games a lot easier. And it was the first of its kind, a handheld that had something like a joystick. It wasn't quite a joystick, it was still a D-pad, but it was like kind of in the middle between a D-pad and a, a joystick or an analog stick or whatever you want to call it these days. Overall, it was a good system, but unfortunately could not compete with Nintendo, so the third-party support ended pretty quickly. All right, so we got these two released in the same generation, and they both deserve the same ranking. I don't think I think the PlayStation Vita and the 3DS are on par with each other. Uh, obviously not graphically, but in terms of being solid handhelds, I decided to rank these at, at a B ranking because these are. I mean, the, the 3DS did li live to its full potential. I think I think it was as good as it, it was going to get at that point, especially hand for a handheld. It was doing pretty good at that point when smartphones were supposedly killing handhelds the nintendo 3ds managed to sell roughly 80 million units which nothing to scuff at because most home consoles don't even reach that number so the 3ds was a very good system in my opinion i i know a lot of people didn't like the 3d gimmick i actually as someone who does criticize nintendo a lot for their stupid gimmicks i thought the 3d was fun for what it was I enjoyed it very much. I love playing Mario Kart in 3D. I love playing Mario 3D Land in 3D. I love playing most games in 3D, actually, like Star Fox 64. Zelda in 3D was kind of like, eh, you know, it was like, whatever. But at a time when 3D was, was blowing up all over the place, and you, you had to have special glasses in order to get any 3D, the 3DS was pretty innovative in the sense that it had no no glasses required, no special equipment. You could just use the 3D slider and it worked. Now the 2DS, uh, let's talk about that real quickly. Uh, I didn't decide to separately place the 2DS because it is essentially a version of the 3DS. But the 2DS I didn't like very much. I honestly, like if the 2DS was the 3DS and that was the only thing they released... I would give it a C because it was very uncomfortable and it just was not a good layout. I know a lot of people hate the clamshell, but that giant ass 2DS 
it felt very uncomfortable and I did not like it. And another reason why the 3DS was not ranked higher. Well, one reason why the 3DS wasn't ranked higher, because I've been saying nothing but good things about it. So why is it only a B? Games were great. Overall, it was, it was, it was great. It had some pretty nice features, too. I liked how it integrated the Miis and everything with, with it. And it ported a lot of good GameCube games over, like Luigi's Mansion. And it was overall good. My main problem with it was later in its life cycle, they decided to release the new 3DS. So your 3DS, it's... it's re so this is Nintendo paying you back for being punishing you for being an early adopter, basically, because there were some games that were exclusive to the new 3DS that you could not play if you had an old 3DS. And that would definitely confuse kids because it said 3DS and they put the game in and it doesn't work. So that's kind of shitty. But the 3DS also, another problem I have with the 3DS, besides it, like, pretty much being obsolete really quickly because they kept releasing better versions of it. Analog. The the slider. I hated it. I thought it was awful. It, it was okay. It was it was bearable. And I liked how you could you were able to use it backwards compatible with DS games, like playing Super Mario 64 DS with that 3D analog stick was 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 a godsend in my opinion. And even playing games like Pokemon with the analog was just so much more fun. And it was just it just was a better experience in my opinion. So I think the integration with the analog into older DS games was pretty good. And I thought the the analog was okay. I just didn't like that stupid slider thing. And it also only had one analog stick, which wasn't great considering the PlayStation Vita had two, as you could see. But overall, the 3DS was a solid handheld not my favorite definitely not my favorite thing by nintendo but it was overall a solid handheld experience now the playstation vita the playstation vita also had so much great potential but sony decided after only a year let's just not let's just not we're not going to care about the vita anymore we're not going to release games on it and the games that they did release on it were total trash. I mean, they had, you know, a few good ones, like the, the PlayStation Vita Little Big Planet. And Uncharted Golden Abyss was good for what it was. It was a solid single-player experience on the go. And I enjoyed it very much. But the thing I the problem I had with the Vita was like most of the other games that released on it were not very good. The Kill Zone game, uh, what was the other one? Uh Black Ops Declassified. You had a lot of like games that were released on the PlayStation Vita that were just gimmicky, touch screen piles of crap. Like Uncharted Golden Abyss would have been better if it didn't force that terrible gimmick down my throat where you had to do the charcoal rubbings and all that. If anyone even remember, knows what I'm talking about, I didn't like that very much. But that was like the only, but it was still a really good game, don't get me wrong. But. That was really the only, like, amazing, like, really good game that I played. They Then they just decided, okay, we're just going to port PS3 games onto here, like Borderlands 2 and the Walking Dead Telltale game and all these other games that you could just play on your console. And I guess I, I understand it's, like, you know, enticing to some people that you could play your favorite games on the go. And it, it has cross-save, too. So if you had the, the PS3 version, you could cross-save your save of Borderlands 2 on the Vita. But I think that's where really when handheld consoles start to digress a lot. Instead of trying to be its own experience, it's just banked on the fact that people would just be interested in playing their favorite games on the go. And that's just, you know, it, handheld gaming was a lot more than that. It used to be its own unique experience because it had technical limitations compared to home consoles. But instead, you know, to make up for that, they had their own unique features. Like, for example, the 3DS had the 3D. You couldn't do that in any other console. I mean, you could do it on the PS3, but you need to have special glasses and a special 3D TV. The 3DS made 3D more accessible to so many people. And the DS, nowhere near the quality of the GameCube or the PS2 release back then, but it made up for it with its dual screen gimmick, which actually you know made gaming experiences very unique. And we will get to the DS very soon. But man, if the PlayStation Vita had better games, and you might say the Vita had great games, but I think when it comes to, like, if you're not into Japanese games, if you're not into indie games, it really wasn't a good system. 
And that's the bottom line when it comes to the PlayStation Vita. It had so much potential, but for some reason, Sony decided it wasn't worth their time. I don't understand why. But, whatever. Alright, so this these two consoles deserve to be in the A ranking. The Game Boy Advance and the Nintendo DS. Now, let's address the elephant in the room. The pictures you see right here are better versions of the original, meaning that if they didn't release these two versions, they would probably be, like, maybe in the B rank. Especially the DS, uh, definitely the Game Boy Advance, because no backlight on the original one. But I feel like they rectified that pretty quickly. And it wasn't a situation like the like the new 3DS that was an improved version of 3DS, but there weren't games that were exclusive on one DS over another or one Game Boy Advance over another. It, it was brighter, and it had a backlight, and that made it better. But it, the Game Boy as a platform, in terms of the games that it had, was still very amazing. I think of, of Sonic Advance, Mario Advance... Uh, th those are ju just just games that I can think of. Even those those uh, those 2D Crash Bandicoot games were pretty good, but uh, I think it deserves an A ranking only because the the S rank game the S rank consoles are better in my opinion. But I think overall the Game Boy Advance was uh, was one of the best handhelds Nintendo's ever come out with, and it was just great it was uh, one of my best one of my favorite handheld experiences uh, growing up as a kid the game boy advance was 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 uh was awesome absolutely amazing i i love the game boy advance it's probably one of my favorite definitely de well it's definitely obviously you could tell by the list it's one of my favorite handhelds of all time compare i can't distinguish these two like i can't tell you which one i think is better because i think they're both on par with each other in my opinion, in terms of the game library. I guess you could make the case that the DS is better because it could play all of the Game Boy Advance games, but I just felt like it was kind of awkward, a little bit awkward, trying to play Game Boy Advance games on the DS, only because, I mean, you know, it was just weird having one screen on and one screen off, and because I was so used to having two screens on my DS that playing games with only one screen was kind of weird to me. So... But overall, you know, if you never had a Game Boy Advance, the DS was pretty solid with backwards compatibility. It was pretty cool. But also Picto Chat. <laughs> Picto Chat was fun back in the day. Uh, what were some good, good games on the DS? Uh, I remember Nintendogs. I was obsessed with that. As soon as I said Nintendogs, my dog decided to move around. I don't know if you were able to hear her on the microphone, but yeah, she, she could be a pain in the ass sometimes, but I love her. Um... D-pad was really good, uh, better than the Game Boy Advance in my opinion. I like how he had four buttons instead of you know just two. Yeah, finally moving to moving on with handheld gaming. Uh, I like how it had a microphone with some cases, and and you were able to like blow into the screen, and also the stylus. You were you were really able to interact with the games, and these were pretty good games. Uh, I like the Sonic Rush games also. Uh, I like the Mario games on the DS. I love New Super Mario Brothers back in the day. And those are just some of the games I could think from the top of my head. But overall, the DS was an amazing console. The two-screen feature was very intuitive and very innovative. Having, like, one... You know, some games where it's just the, the entire game's on the top, and then you have, like, a map on the bottom. They always found some way to utilize the second screen, and it never disappointed, in my opinion. And that's why I think the Nintendo DS deservingly deserves an A rank. I don't think it deserves an S rank only for I'll get into it when I do reveal the S rank because I there were a couple problems with the DS. But let's get on with the finale, the S rank, which are the very best and based on what I've gone through so far, you could tell which two handhelds are going to be on this list. The original Game Boy and the PSP. I can't tell which one of these which, between the Game Boy and the PSP, which one is the all-time best. I really can't. I can't decide that. Honestly, I cannot. I really can't distinguish between the two. Like which one is is the best one for its time? Because for its time, the PSP was way better than the DS, and that's really why the DS didn't get an S rank, because. 
the PSP versus the DS. It just wasn't a con- it wasn't even a contest, man. The PSP was so much better. It was a multimedia device. You could listen to music, watch movies, watch TV shows, browse the internet. The Nintendo DS had a web browser cartridge thing, but it really you can't compare it. Uh, and the games were were awesome. I'm not going to say that the games were better than DS games. They were different because the DS utilized the touchscreen and it was a different experience. But the PSP had amazing games and it was also a multimedia device where you could do more things than just play games, which at the time was a pretty big deal. I mean, this thing did more than play games, but we're not we're not going to go back to the GameCom or the Game.com, whatever you want to call it. Total piece of shit. But this did the PSP was was awesome, uh, and it was definitely the best. Definitely a mo- like I-, I can't. It's tied with the Game Boy to be the best handheld in my opinion, because the games were so amazing. They actually felt like console quality games, and that's honestly why another reason why I think it deserves an S rank because the actual games were amazing. You had the God of, God of War on the PSP was was awesome. Metal Gear Solid and my personal favorite games, Vice City Stories and Liberty City Stories for the PSP. They literally felt like console quality Grand Theft Auto games. They had a couple limitations to it, but they were so good that they decided to port it to the PlayStation 2. Also, you had uh, Ratchet and Clank Size Matters, which I didn't think was that great. But I thought Secret Agent Clank was amazing. I thought it was like a great stealth action game. I I love Secret Agent Clank growing up. And then you also had Star Wars Battlefront for the PSP. I think it was what? Star Wars Battlefront Renegade Squadron? I thought that was a pretty good game. Although not nearly as good as the, the PS2 games obviously. But you had some pretty solid games on the PSP. Like some of the best handheld games ever released. And I think that the PSP deserves deserves an S rank because it really is an amazing... It, it is tied with the Game Boy as the best handheld console because none of this stuff can ever beat the P- PSP in terms of the actual quality of the game, the games, uh, in terms of the, bu- the button layout and controls. Just it, all around, it's... A near perfect handheld device. You could do more than just play games, also, like I said. Back before you had the smartphones, that was a really big deal. So, let's talk about the. the I saved the best for last, or, you know, whatever you want. Tied for the best. What, whatever you want to say. The Game Boy. The original Game Boy. This started the whole the whole handheld revolution. This is the reason why handheld gaming exists, and the reason why it was able to flourish for so many years, and you had so many amazing on the go gaming experiences over the years. You could thank just this is responsible for all of it. The the Game Boy. At at the time, it was revolutionary. Similar to the PSP, you had games that were released on it that actually felt like they belonged on a console, and that console at the time was the NES. Of course, it had its issues, like you know you couldn't see, you had to, yeah, it had to be well lit. It wasn't backlit. But man, Pokemon, uh, Tetris, uh, Mario Land, those experiences on the go. I will never forget that. Like th- those are some of the best experience game experiences I've ever had, ever. So, and, and just the, the just besides the fact that the Game Boy started everything, it has to be the, at the top, along with the PSP, because I really can't decide between the two which one's better. But in terms of innovation, in terms of revolutionizing handheld gaming. Nothing can beat the Game Boy. And at the time, it was a big deal. And it dominated the handheld gaming industry for over a decade. And had no competition. And actually came to a point where they released the Game Boy Color late into the Game Boy's life cycle. And at that point, the Game Boy was just competing with itself. It had no real competition. 
and the Game Boy Color was also awesome, but I didn't want to rank it as its own system because you did have a few exclusives similar to the new 3DS, but I felt like it would be a bit redundant having all the variations of every console on this list. It would be way too long, and it's long already, so, you know, let's not do that. But I gotta say, overall, the, the Game Boy's gotta be at the top, along with the PSP. And like I said, I love my DS to death. But I just had an overall more fun and better experience with the PSP in terms of the games, in terms of multimedia features, and just having an overall better value of my money with this over the Nintendo DS. And that's why I got to rank the, the PSP. Also, the controls were much better. You had a little analog slider, as you can see over here. And, you know, like I said, I loved the DS when I was a kid, but, you know, when I got a little bit older, uh, I kind of, you know, geared more towards the PSP. And the PSP was amazing. Like I said, playing GTA on the PSP was awesome. Was just downright amazing. And you had the PSP 1000, 3000, you had the PSP Go. No matter which variation it was, the PSP was always the best. Now, the PSP Go, a lot of people didn't like. But for what it was, it was pretty good because it was a cheaper version of the PSP. It was digital only. I, I think Microsoft took a, took a few notes from that because they're apparently releasing a uh, digital only Xbox One X. But the PSP had, Go had no UMD support and it was very controversial at the time. And this was back in 2009. But it was cheaper and you know for what it was, it was okay. I have no problem with the PSP Go. But I obviously prefer the PSP 1000, 2000, 3000. I think the 3000 was the best one. But overall, the PSP was definitely among the best, along with the Game Boy. Game Boy Advance and DS were also great, but I just couldn't put them along with the S rank because I think these two are just far better, far more innovative, and just overall better handhelds than these two, so I couldn't put them on the same rank. PS Vita and 3DS were a little bit underwhelming, but overall solid handhelds. Game Gear, Turbo Express, Shield, and Neo Geo Pocket Color were okay. Weren't great, weren't even particularly good, but they were okay. The D, the D handhelds were barely passable, but I couldn't, I couldn't have them among, among these because these were just total pieces of shit. But as handhelds, these were very underwhelming and not very good. So that's why the Switch, Nomad, Lynx, and Wonder Swan deserve a D rank because they're not good, not really that, not good at all, pretty bad as handhelds. But can't have them along here. You know, that would just be an insult to the to these handhelds to place them along here. That just wouldn't be right. So, anyway, it was a long list, and we've been going for quite a long time. Let me know if you guys agree or disagree with any of the placements on this list, and I'll catch you guys later. Peace.